Lecture number three. We're going to give you some of the basics of plate tectonics. I want to begin by defining the word tectonics. It comes from the Greek word tekton, meaning builder of relief. Now, relief on the Earth's surface is nothing more than the difference in elevation between a high point and a low point, like a mountain and a valley. And so, we've already been talking about creating relief on Earth. In our previous lecture, we were talking about rock structure and how uh, really strong rock uh, creates uh, high points in the landscape, you know, creating uh, mountains, right? And then weak rock erodes and creates, you know, valleys. So rock structure is definitely, you know, a major way to create relief on Earth. Now, the point here is plate tectonics is another major way to create relief on Earth how we create high mountains and deep, deep valleys. I'll be defining the word plate and plate tectonics in just a few slides. I want to begin by uh, taking a slice right through Earth and reviewing the Earth structure. And very simply, you can uh, define three zones. And the first zone we're not really concerned with, it's the Earth's core, but it's a pretty uh, thick zone, averaging over 2,000 miles in diameter, but that's all we need to say about that. Uh, this next one is starred. Uh, the middle layer is another thick layer. Uh, it's the mantle, uh, and it's pretty thick, averaging about 1,800 miles in diameter. Now, we are going to be concerned with the mantle, uh, just this upper portion, right, near to the Earth's surface. And then the Earth's crust, right, uh, comparat comparatively is very, very thin. Uh, so it's rock averaging about 5 to 25 miles in thickness. And so it's the upper mantle and the crust that we're going to be most concerned with. So what we're going to do is uh, look at the details. We're going to kind of take a 100-mile cut, right, uh, into the Earth and just give you some of the uh, terminology, the basic uh, features uh, of the upper mantle and uh Earth's crust. So here's the terms. All right. So here's um, our 100 mile cut. Here's you know, sea level zero, and we're 100 miles into the Earth. And this tan area is going to be the upper mantle, and then here we've got the Earth's crust. And so for both uh, zones, we're going to be able to identify uh, two areas. All right. Now, the lowermost area uh, in the upper mantle is called the asthenosphere. And asthenosphere means, astheno means soft in Greek. And so this is where magma is, you know, molten rock deep within the earth. Um, and so, uh, you, so you'll encounter magma, you know, normally, uh, you know, maybe about 40 miles below the earth's surface or 100 miles below. And then extending to some depth, you know, another 100 or 200 miles. It kind of depends on where you are. Right? And so um, the interesting thing or the important point about the asthenosphere is that this magma ultimately makes its way to the Earth's surface through fault lines and fractures and is ultimately the source of all lava flows on the Earth's surface. All right, now lying on top of the asthenosphere uh, is, is another portion of the upper mantle called the lithosphere. Now, this is solid rock. This is igneous rock. Uh, I know there's a zone of gradation, but we wind up with a, a layer of solid rock Again, varying in depth, but pretty much just, you know, lying on top of this uh, molten layer of the asthenosphere. So uh, those are the two layers of the, of the uh, upper mantle. Now let's do the two layers of the, uh, or the two zones of the Earth's crust. And these are side by side, not on top of one another. Um, the ocean crust. Right. And it's basically the rock of the ocean sea floors. And uh, the ocean sea floor rock is, is thinner, averaging about five miles thick. And there's the ocean there. And then uh, side by side, I mean, <laughs> you've got the rock of the continents, right? And the rock of the continents yeah, are, are thicker. And so this is where you've got the thickest portion of the Earth's crust. All right. So now that we've got you know, the basics, right, uh, you know, makeup, we're able now to define what a plate is and plate tectonics. So let's do that. And so I've got the same diagram, and I've just, you know, added, you know, uh, added a, a big fault line here, all right, a big fault line. And, and what is a plate and plate tectonics? It's the solid rock of the Earth's crust and the solid rock of the lithosphere fractured into large pieces. So that's why I've drawn this here. I want to show a big fracture line and we're creating two plates 
And the le- you know the leading edge of movement, all right, defines you know whether it's going to be a continental plate or an ocean plate. And so here, if the the leading edge is a, is a continent moving, you call it a continental plate. If the leading edge you know is the ocean, you call it an ocean plate. Right. So you wind up with you know big uh, you know big solid portions of the Earth's uh, crust. All right, and uh, literally, they're able to float on top of the asthenosphere. All right, and it's, this floating is kind of you know important in, in how the the continents are able to you know to move around to move around. And again, it's it's you know critical that you've got the magma and this fault line. You know, and the magma is able to li- literally push the the plates apart. And this they're floating, so that's they're able to shift around and move. And of course, whenever a plate moves, <laughs> you've got an earthquake. So here's a, a map uh, showing uh, 14 major uh, plates that are found on Earth, and they're all named, and they tend to move in particular directions. And I'll, I'll be talking about a couple of these plates when giving you some examples of plate movements. All right, I want to go back uh, to how uh, the theory of plate tectonics began, right? It was originally called um, continental drift. And the theory of continental drift was first proposed in the early 20th century by a German geographer. And back in 1912, his name was Alfred Wagner, right? So he came up with the, the first idea back in 1912, all right? And he stated, all right, that uh, at one time, you know, 250 million years ago, all of the continents uh, on Earth all right, were attached, forming one giant supercontinent. So there was a single continent. And actually, you know, being a geographer, you know, what do we, what do, we do? I mean, we look at maps. And I, I know you've noticed this. I mean, you can, have you ever seen how, like, South America seems like it could almost fit into the bulge of Africa? All right? That's like a really good example. Like, like a pieces of a puzzle. And uh, and other evidence too, besides you know almost seeming to match up like pieces of of a puzzle, is you know similar geology. Like there's some particular geology that's the exact same here, you know, matching up with Africa, and the same here too, matching geologic structures in North America and Europe. And uh, so, uh, in his article in 1912, uh, you know, proposing this theory of continental drift. Uh, you know, he, he named this single supercontinent that ultimately broke up and, you know, the continents drift, drifted apart. He named this supercontinent Pangea. And again, it's Greek. Pan means all. Gea or geo means earth. And so, you know, 250 million years ago, there was one supercontinent and he named it Pangea. Now, the thing is, uh, his theory, right, this article that he published in 1912 was totally discarded. Uh, it was seemed impossible. Uh, and, and geologists and geographers, you know, at the time just considered it ridiculous. And the reason is, is, um, you know, it, you know, it seems like the continents would fit together, but the problem is, he said they drifted apart, but he couldn't say how, right? He couldn't come up with a mechanism as to how the, the continents moved. And that's why his theory was uh, discarded. Uh, but anyways, I'm going to kind of move on to uh, what he, he published and uh, the breakup of Pangea, even though it was, you know, not really accepted at the time. But uh, so here's Pangea 250 million years ago with kind of the, the outline of the continents that we have. And then uh, eventually Pangea, he said, split into two giant continents, basically a northern hemisphere continent. And he named it Laurasia, you know, basically North America and Europe and Asia. Named it Laurasia after the St. Lawrence River and the Laurentian upland of Canada. And then there was a southern hemisphere landmass uh, that is a little bit more complex, uh, you know, it contained, you hear know, South America and Africa attached, uh, Antarctica, Australia, and India. And Gondwan is kind of a funny name, but actually it's a, a geologic region in India, right, uh, Gondwana. And he named, uh, you know, the southern hemisphere uh, continent Gondwana because, you know, here's India here in the southern hemisphere, and, you know, and now it's in the northern hemisphere. It moved, it drifted northward. And so that's kind of a special feature, and that's why they, they named it that. 
All right. And so then, so we have two giant continents and then the continents uh, continue to drift, all right? Drift, pull apart, drift and drift and drift and pull apart until we have the configuration that we have today, all right? And so that was the basic theory. Now, uh, it wasn't until uh, the 1960s, all right, that, uh, you know, with modern technology, uh, that geologists were able to determine, you know, the the, the upper mantle, the details of the upper mantle, that there was the asthenosphere, that molten layer, you know, the lithosphere, and the details of the Earth's crust, and uh, and just doing a little simple geography and mapping, you know, the epicenter of you know all known earthquakes, and if you do that, that actually outlines all the major plates on Earth. All right, and so now we've got you know the plates outlined, and now we know that the you know, the asthenosphere, that magma, is you know pushing on up through these plate boundaries and causing them to move. All right, and so of course whenever they move, there's an there's an earthquake, and you know the interesting thing is that uh, Wagner's theory, you know was finally confirmed, you know, and so, I mean, of course, at the time, he didn't have the technology uh, to, to prove, uh, you know, how the continents uh, drifted apart, but now we now, now we know, all right, now we know. So, the, the name uh, was changed then uh, from the theory of continental drift to the theory of plate tectonics, so that's what we call it today. So I want to go over uh, some of the plate boundaries uh, and how we create relief on Earth, you know, high points and low points. I'm just going to go over two scenarios. I'm going to you know, just do uh, spreading boundaries uh, and then converging boundaries. And actually with this first one, the spreading boundary, I'm just going to give you one really big example of what's going on, of two ocean plates spreading. So this is like the leading edge in this block diagram of two ocean plates spreading apart. And here's the arrows here. Now the term in geology for, you know, pulling apart or spreading, the term is called rifting. Right. And this is the example of what's going on on the seafloor of the Atlantic Ocean. All right. And so here we've got the, the fracture right down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and we've got two ocean plates spreading, two ocean plates spreading. And here's the fracture line here, all right, where we've got the two ocean plates, you know, making up the seafloor of the Atlantic Ocean, all right, spreading. There's big offset here, and then it kind of continues on up into uh, Iceland here. And I've got some arrows here kind of showing the spreading boundary. All right, so right at the spreading boundary, uh, well, we've got um, the magma rising from the asthenosphere in this fracture, right? And it's, you know, pushing the plates apart. And at the same time, we have the magma now, uh, you know, uh, actually creating lava flows on the seafloor, right? Lava flows and lava flows and lava flows. And so you wind up creating relief on the seafloor by all these lava flows. And it's called the mid-ocean ridge of higher elevation, thousands of feet. And so the lava flows and mountains and volcanoes are building up high elevation, highest elevation on the seafloor. And so it's a ridge of higher elevation. And you can see all the high mountain elevations here in the orange colors here, right, right along the mid-ocean ridge. All right. Kind of, we're still talking about the spreading boundary of the of the Atlantic Ocean. All right, so at one time, uh, you know, the ancestral Atlantic Ocean was much smaller, right? And so the the you know the plates, uh, the ocean plates are now spreading, right? But another uh, important point that I want to make is since um, it is the magma rising from the asthenosphere that's pushing the plates apart, and then you have lava flows on the seafloor. Well, what is the rock of the deep ocean basins? then. It's an extrusive igneous rock, right? And so that lava is going to cool very, very fast on the on the seafloor. And so the rock of the deep ocean basins is basalt. That really dark brown to black, uh, you know, fine grained rock. Very, very common uh, extrusive igneous rock. And it's really dense too. All right. And uh, what the geologists have found that actually, you know, further confirms the, the theory of uh, you know, plate tectonics is they dated uh, the, you know, the age of the basalt and they found, you know, brand new 
you know, uh, basalt, you know, right at the mid-ocean ridge. And then the, the plate is spreading by the magma rising. And so that, that new, you know, young uh, basalt is now a little bit older, right? And you're creating new, right, and new, and it gets older and older and older, almost like a conveyor belt. And so you wind up with, you know, very young basalt, you know, brand new rock, right, uh, right at the mid-ocean ridge. And then, you know, because of this con kind of conveyor belt theory, you wind up with progressively older and older and older basalt with distance, you know, from the mid-ocean ridge, right? And so this is the classic symbol in geology for basalt rock. You know, it's got these columns in it. And so in lecture number four, I'm going to be talking about the, the jointing pattern in, in basalt rock. And it looks just like this with these columns. Maybe you'll remember that. All right. So um, that's what's going on the seafloor of the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, it's pretty amazing. What, what I want to do now is just do the opposite. Let's uh, look at plates that are now converging or meeting. Now, for this, I want to give you three examples, you know, three different scenarios. And the first one, uh, the first scenario is the meeting of a continental plate. The leading edge of a continental plate is, you know, encountering the leading edge of an ocean plate, all right? And so that's what we're going to look at. And I've got some terminology that I'm going to give you. So let's just um, start. Okay, so this is the same diagram. All right, uh, all right, so what's going to wind up happening, all right, is uh, of the process of subduction. What you wind up is you've got a dense, all right, uh, a dense and thinner uh, ocean plate, all right? You've got, you've got the dense basalt rock, and remember, the sea, the ocean crust is thinner, all right? And so the, the ocean plate is thinner. And then it's going to encounter a much thicker uh, continental plate, all right? You've got the continental crust and then the lithosphere, so it's going to wind up being thicker. Now, the thing is, the, the, the rock of the continents uh, are less dense because you've got sedimentary rock here, all right, compared to just that very, very dense uh, uh, basalt. So what's going to wind up happening is... Uh, the the leading edge of the ocean plate is going to literally be forced to plunge beneath the continent. And this is actually where we just were. I mean, we we're in the middle of, a, of an ocean floor and it's pulling apart or spreading. And you've got the new basalt and then the progressively older basalt. And so this, you know, this dense old basalt winds up being forced to plunge you know, beneath the, the, the continent and back into the asthenosphere and it remelts. All right, it's believed to remelt, and there might actually be some sort of convection uh, current going on with the newly remelted uh, lava and then rising again, maybe, all right? But anyways, all right, uh, another term, too, I'm going to uh, move on and talk about uh, ocean trenches, all right, associated with that subduction process. Now, these are very, very deep uh, depressions on the ocean floor marking the line of subduction. So it's kind of evidence of subduction. And uh, so here's the deep ocean trench, and they are miles, all right, deep. All right, so talk about relief. So you've got, you know, you know, mountains there at the, you know, at the, at the ridge, right? You have thousands of feet tall, and then you've got, you know, miles, all right, uh, deep trenches as the basalt is, you know, plunging uh, back in, into the uh, asthenosphere. So, uh, and, you know, your average ocean trench where you've got subduction is a couple miles, you know, deep, right, you know, compared to the, you know, the surrounding ocean floor. So, really a tremendous amount of relief on the ocean floor. And really, uh, the, the deepest ocean trench is in the Pacific Ocean. It's the Mariana Trench, and it's going down 36,000 feet, or, or, or about seven miles deep, all right? So, you want to talk about tremendous relief on the ocean floor between the, the ridges you know, and the volcanoes on the seafloor and uh, the deep ocean trenches. All right. What I want to do now is look at the leading edge of the continental plate in this process. All right. So let's kind of talk about that. All right. All right. So here we've got the same diagram, just enlarged here. But always along the leading edge of the continental plate, you've always got a line, right, of volcanic mountains, right, a volcanic mountain chain. And so you, you have a big mountain range, right, a big mountain range, but each individual mountain that's making up that mountain range is a volcano, all right? And they're associated with this subduction zone process, so they're called subduction zone volcanoes, 
all right and it's all due to the remelting of that old basalt and it's believed it must be that the remelted basalt all right must be less dense than the rock in the continents uh, because it's always rising you've always got rising magma and it rises through fractures and fault lines and pore spaces any way it can and it rises on up that magma and then it starts to flow onto the earth's surface as lava flows and lava flows and lava flows and winds up eventually you know building up mountain ranges right big mountain ranges and i want to give you uh two what I think are really good examples of mountain ranges along subduction zone boundaries. Now, these mountain ranges are made up of individual volcanoes. And the first example I want to give you is in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. And it's the Cascade Mountains that I, we talked about in regards to orographic precip. So, you know, it, uh, this mountain range, you know, begins in, uh, in, in, uh, British Columbia, Canada, and extends through Washington and Oregon into Northern California. Now, each one of these little triangles are, are volcanoes, volcanic mountains. They're all volcanoes right in through here, all right? And what's going on here, this is where we're going to take a look at you know, some, of the, some of the plates in detail. So here's the Pacific Northwest, and this is where the Cascade Mountains are. There's this tiny little plate here. This blue plate is called the Juan de Fuca Plate, is subducting. Uh, beneath the uh, continental portion of the North American plate. Now, at one time, the Juan de Fuca plate was much larger, but it's subducting, all right? And so it's causing rising magma and the formation of all of these volcanic peaks, all right? And we, and you know, the average elevation of these mountains, they're, they're, they're up to about 14,000 feet, right? So this, those are pretty tall from lava flows. And also they, um, they have explosions and they, they break up rock and you wind up with, you know, masses of, uh, of, of ash that also uh, wind up, you know, forming these uh, high mountain peaks. Yeah, and so some of these uh, volcanoes are pretty famous uh, in the Cascades. Mount St. Helens is famous because this was the last one to erupt back in 1980. And actually, in this case, it didn't build itself up, all right? It actually, the entire north face, you know, <laughs> it got blown apart. And actually, I think it lost about a 1,000 feet uh, in elevation. So sometimes they can have violent eruptions and not, you know, build themselves up. Uh, let's see, what's, Mount Rainier is very famous uh, because from downtown Seattle on a clear day, you can see uh, the snow-capped, you know, 14,000-foot Mount Rainier. And then uh, it's a national park. Mount St. Helens is a national park. Mount Rainier is a national park. And uh, what's other a famous one here? Oh, Mount Hood is also famous, uh, again, because you can see Mount Hood uh, uh, from, you know, downtown Portland. So that's a pretty neat one, too. All right. And so um, the, the interesting thing is that this plate hasn't moved in uh, over 400 years. There has not been a major earthquake, and they're due. That's the thing about the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and, the, you know, ge geological survey is really making awareness, you know, of an eventual big one, a big earthquake, uh, because right now the Juan de Fuca plate is locked, all right? But they are ready. It's long overdue. Uh, for a big earthquake, and they're worried about uh, tsunamis uh, associated with that. And so if you ever go there or you go to the coastal areas, you'll, you'll see all these tsunami and earthquake warnings uh, for the big one that, that might be happening sometime in the next few decades or century. All right, another really good example of subduction zone volcanoes are the Andes Mountains. Now, the Andes Mountains are one of the tallest and longest mountain ranges on earth located all along the west side of south america and uh this is where the ocean plate the nazca plate is subducting beneath the continental portion of the south american plate and there's the symbol for subduction it looks like a cold front here but it's subducting and it's uh creating uh you know, a whole series of volcanic mountain peaks right along the west coast of South America. Yeah. And so here's these little triangles. They're all the volcanoes here. Okay. Uh, and then uh, here's the Nazca plate over here. And there's a, a kind of the cold front symbol for, um, you know, for the subduction. All right. And well, actually, this is the actually identifying the trench. Okay. Where subduction is actually occurring. All right. And so... 
Yeah, here we go. Yeah, and so here is the Nazca Plate subducting, all right? And then you've got um, the Andes Mountains. And the Andes Mountains are, you know, much taller than the mountains in North America. In general, you know, the tall mountains of the Rockies and the Sierra Nevada and the Cascades, you know, they get up to 14,000 feet. But here, we uh, the mountains in the north uh, begin at about 17,000 feet in the, in the northern Andes. And then as you move southward, the mountains get taller, you know, to 18, 19, 20. And the tallest one uh, is Mount Aconcagua right here at 23,000 feet. So it really is a, you know, a tall uh, mountain range with each individual mountain mountain peak is a volcano. And here's some of the volcanoes here. Here we are in Ecuador, uh, one of the volcanoes, you know, at the equator, actually. You know, who knows what, what it is, 18, 20,000 feet, I don't know. But it's snow-capped, right? It's how tall it is. And then here's the famous Space Needle in um, downtown Seattle. And there's the beautiful, uh, in, you know, Mount Rainier. And, of course, that's glaciated and snow-capped there, too. And that's 14,000 feet. All right. I want to uh, move on uh, to a second scenario. Again, uh, plates are converging. All right. Now, in this case, we're going to have the convergence of, of two ocean plates. Two ocean plates. Now, what's going to wind up happening is one of these plates is going to wind up subducting. All right. Whatever plate is denser or thinner, right? And so in this case, whatever, this is a thinner plate or, you know, or it's denser, you know, it's older. And so the rock becomes more dense. And so one of them, you know, is going to wind up subducting, even though they're, you know, they're both ocean plates. So subduction can occur. All right. And what winds up happening is kind of the same thing. You know, you got subduction, you've got a deep ocean trench, right? And then uh, you wind up with melting of the old o ocean floor. And then you wind up with the magma rising, right? It's kind of the same thing. So along the leading edge of the opposite plate, you wind up building up uh, lava flow after lava flow in volcanoes. But in this case, you wind up, uh, you know, each individual volcano mountain peak winds up making an island, a volcanic island in the Pacific in the Pacific Ocean. That's where they're really common, and uh, so you wind up, you know, basically it's a you know volcanic mountain chain, but it's the individual mountain peaks that wind up creating you know individual islands, and they're called island arcs because the plates are kind of rounded, you know, and so uh, typically, you know, where the subduction is going on, you know, you wind up, you know, having the rising magma, you know, kind of in a circular pattern around the, you know, the shape of, of that plate. So they're called island arcs, right? So it is kind of a similar process. And uh, I'm going to give you some examples of uh, some of the island arcs uh, in the Pacific Ocean. Um Really, a good example is, uh, God, the country of New Zealand. I mean, it's volcanoes, very tectonically active. And so there's New Zealand there. So what's going on is this Pacific plate here is subducting beneath the ocean portion of the Austral Indian plate. So we got two ocean plates here uh, creating uh, the volcanic islands of New Zealand. Now, uh, the country of Indonesia is made up of a whole bunch of islands, big and small, all right, all along this arc. It's a nice example, actually, of, a, of an island arc. And this, uh, the country of Indonesia with all the islands, again, the ocean portion of the Austral Indian Plate is subducting beneath the ocean portion of the Eurasian Plate. Let's see what else do we have. The islands of the Philippines. Okay, here they are here. All right. The Philippines are all volcanoes. Oh, just like Indonesia, they're all volcanoes. All right, here's the Philippines. I don't know. Okay. And again, the Philippine plate is subducting its ocean beneath the ocean portion of the Eurasian plate. And our final really good example of an island arc with the meeting of two ocean plates are the uh, volcanic islands of Japan. There are all volcanoes there. And so the, ocean, the, the Pacific plate here is subducting beneath the ocean portion of the Eurasian plate. And so those are just some examples of, you know, two ocean plates meeting, creating volcanic island islands, you know, kind of forming arcs and, and some examples here. Now, you might be thinking of, you know, the Hawaiian islands in the Pacific Ocean. They're volcanoes, all right, and they're volcanic island chain. But the thing is, uh, the islands of Hawaii are not formed in this manner. They're not at a plate boundary. They're actually located uh, right in the middle of the giant Pacific plate. 
And so the islands of Hawaii uh, are not at a plate boundary and are not formed in this manner. And in the next lecture, I, I will definitely be talking about how the, the Hawaiian islands were formed. But the, they are not an example uh, uh, in this uh, of two plates meeting for sure, okay, because there they are. All right, finally, uh, my third scenario of plates meeting are two continental plates converging, all right? And so you've got, you know, two thick masses of rock, all right, of, you know, continental crust or continental plate, you know, masses of rock meeting. And so what you're going to do is you're going to just, see you know, they're meeting, they're going to uplift and fold and fault, and you get some masses of rock, you know, accumulating and accumulating and creating really high mountain ranges, very, very high mountain ranges. Yeah. And our, our best example of continent to continent collision uh, is the formation of the Himalaya mountains and the Tibetan plateau behind it. All right. And so the uh, here's the leading edge of the Himalaya Mountains here, and then behind it is the uplifted Tibetan Plateau, right? And uh, I just kind of want to go back to uh, the theory of uh, continental drift. Now, remember, I, I did point out uh, India here, the triangular shape of India, Gondwana. And remember, it was part of uh, you know the southern hemisphere landmass, uh, but it moved uh, northward and uh, slammed into... Uh, uh, Asia here in the northern hemisphere, and uh, there's the suture there, okay, <laughs> the continent to continent suture, and this is where the Himalayas and other high mountains are, and then big uplift going on behind the Himalayas with the Tibetan plateau. And so India is actually still wanting to move northward. And so there's still a lot of earthquakes going on. And it's very, very, very tectonically active. And um, this is why India is often referred to as a subcontinent. Sometimes you might hear, you know, whatever, the subcontinent of India. Well, it was it was a continent at one time, uh, you know, kind of a small continent, a subcontinent. But now it is indeed attached to, to Asia. End lecture.